Hey guys, this is John, and I'm playing Pet Elephant in the 15-minute pool on ICC. Pet Elephant says, good luck in the chat. I love your channel. Thanks, Pet Elephant. Tell him good luck and thanks. Okay, so he plays a French. Um, I'm going to play a King's Indian attack. This is a, a line that I used to play when I played E4, and I would wheel it out occasionally against the French, like maybe, I don't know, 25% of the time when I faced that opening. I always seem to have good results with it. I won a very key game in um, a tournament where I needed my last IM norm in this line, in fact. So the King's Indian attack is, of course, very flexible, and you can play it against a variety of setups. You can play it against the Sicilian. You can play it against the French, the Caro. Um, it's a, it's a one-stop opening, really. But uh, I don't really recommend it for most players because I'm very much against like system-type openings where you just kind of play the same moves for the first 10 to 15 moves of the game and operate from within the confines of that setup. I don't think that's a good way to learn chess. And in fact, with most of my students, I, I really discourage them from playing that. Uh, I never teach systems like that. But um, if they come to me and they play it, I'll uh, gently try to steer them into something more mainline. So he played a very early queen c7. This is unusual. Sometimes black tries to delay castling in this line. And that appears to be what he's doing in this game. Hmm. It'd be pretty cool if he castled queenside. I mean, it is possible. So what is going on in this position? So if I play e5, I'm just looking at e5 because by playing bishop d7, he's deprived his knight of the d7 square. So you'd have to go to g8 or h5. I guess, no, you can go to g4, never mind. And then this e5 pawn is stranded. So a standard move here would just be like rook e1. I think I should probably play that. Just x-raying his king. Uh, now e5 is strengthened at least. We can make more of a case for that move with our rook and our knight backing up a pawn. Oh yeah, e5 would have just lost a pawn on the previous move. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's been kind of a long day playing this at uh, about almost 11 o'clock at night. And this game is going to go live immediately on my channel after I play it. Win, lose, or draw, as always. Let's check Pet Elephant's stats before we get going. He has only played 10 games on ICC. Six wins, three losses, one draw. Um, so his rating is almost certainly still in flux. He plays d4. I don't know about that move. I mean, he closes the position down. But he gives me this nice c4 square for my knight. Now, do I jump into c4 right away, or do I play something like a4 first to make sure he can't play b5? Or do I play e5 myself? Maybe I want to play um, e5 right away. Because one, one thought I had is if knight c4, maybe he can play e5? I'm looking at a line, knight c4, e5, knight f takes e5, knight c takes e5, bishop here to the f4 square, pinning the knight to his queen. That could be very interesting. I don't know about that line, though. I'm not sure how I feel about it. I could also play c3. Maybe c3 is a better move in this circumstance. I would like to open the position, because I feel like his development thus far has been pretty awkward, like playing the bishop d7 move and not moving this dark square bishop, which black would conventionally want to do to castle. So I want to exploit that somehow, but what's the best way to do that? I mean, if e5, knight d5, do I really have much? Probably not. I might get the c4 and e4 squares for my knights, but for my uh, single knight here, I can come to either one of those, but I'm not really seeing much beyond that. Knight c4 has a, a real nice uh, feature in that it prepares bishop f4, but I'm still not sure what to do about that e5 move. Let's calculate that again. So if knight c4, e5, knight f takes e5, knight takes e5, bishop f4. If he plays knight g4, maybe I have h3, but then he has g5 driving away my bishop. Mm, it's speculative. Huh. You know what? I'm going to play c3. I'm just going to undermine that d4 pawn. 
I was not sure about knight c4, so I'm not going to spend any more time looking at it or worrying about it. By the way, if you pay attention to my rating, I actually increased two points from when I played my game yesterday. Um, that's because I just played a game right before this, but my opponent resigned before any moves were even played. <laughs> so just thought I'd make a note of that. That's happened a couple times, actually. Like, I'll be in the pool waiting, and then suddenly I get a game, and my opponent just immediately resigns. I don't know if they're scared of me or they they know I uh, record games and, like, just don't want to play, which is fair. I mean, that I totally understand that. Still seems weird to just, like, resign a game for <laughs> outright, but um, I don't know. It's people's preference. So if he plays e5 here, I'll take, and I like the fact that the c file will probably become open then. So let's say e5, c takes d4, um, c takes d4. Like maybe I can play knight c4 then and try to quickly get my bishop out and a rook to c1 and x-ray his queen. That would be a nice little plan. Pet elephant seems to be thinking right now. Let's just take a look at his stats real quick. I'm just curious, like, who he's played thus far, just to get a feel for where he's at. I know he played Alakine 101, lost that game. He's kind of had mixed results, and that happens when you're provisional. Okay, so he played bishop to e7. Yeah, I can take on d4 as planned. I think I will. I assume he'll take with a pawn. There's a chance he'll take with the knight, but I think pawn makes more sense. Um, on pawn takes, well, he does take with the knight, okay. I think I'll just take. And then I want to move this knight. I could play knight b3, but I feel like the knight might be misplaced on that square. I'd rather go to, to c4. Yeah, c4 is the proper square. Because now bishop f4 is a nice little move with tempo on his queen. If he plays e5, I can play f4 directly and try to force him to take me and like bludgeon my bishop to f4. Sounds very violent, doesn't it? <laughs> Might not even be the right adjective. We're going to enforce our will on our opponent if he wants to play e5 and keep a nice little pawn structure in the middle. We're going to try to destroy that pawn structure. Because if I wait too long, like if I let him stick around with that pawn on e5, he's going to reorganize. Like he might play like bishop e6, knight d7. He might play f6 as a backup if he ever needs to add another defender to that square. So we got to strike while the iron is hot. There's a couple guys who are higher rated than me on the standard list. Uh, there's one grandmaster, his name is uh, Bones. He's, uh, I think he's a German grandmaster. Uh, Holzman, I think is his name. But uh, his, his username is Bones. And he's like one point ahead of us. I think I might have actually passed him based on that premature resignation game. I'd love to get a game in with him. There's another guy, I think his name is Memento, who's like an FM. He's about 23, 60 or 70, something like that. So we're sitting at like number two or three on the list right now. Okay, so this is the move that I said I was going to play f4 against. And I'm just checking to make sure that like a piece coming into g4 can't disturb us too much. And I don't think it does. So let's pull the trigger on this one. I have a King's Indian pawn structure in reverse. Hence the name of this opening, King's Indian Attack. And when you get this pawn structure, you can often do this. Okay, what's up with b5? Because that just appears to lose a pawn to knight takes e5 or even f takes e5. f takes e5 could be pretty interesting, albeit somewhat unnecessary. <laughs> so knight takes e5 would be the default move here, um, just picking off the pawn and keeping a nice structure. But the reason I like f takes e5 is because, you know, there's only this e4 pawn separating our light square bishop from his rook on a8. So one line I'm kind of just playing around with in my head is f takes e5, b takes c4, e takes f6. And if bishop takes f6, we have e5 hitting the bishop and also opening up this discovery. But that line is not forced, so let's scan that again and 
see if he can improve anywhere. So f takes e5, uh, let's say b takes c4 again, e takes f6, what if he plays g takes f6? Then I could do the same thing e5, but he might just move his rook. No, but then I take an f6, that looks pretty darn good. Well, there's also f takes e5 and just a knight move, like knight g4, but then I was thinking knight d6 with check. Hmm. Nah, it's a little speculative. I think this is just the correct move. You can't go wrong with knight takes e5. This is just a free pawn. Just a free pawn. And I can maybe still try to enforce that plan, like if I go knight takes d7 and then e5 at some point. So he might have just blundered. Uh, I'm not sure why he played b5. Forgot that I could take on e5. Who knows? We'll check that line in the analysis, though. f takes e5, b takes c4. We'll see what the engine thinks about it. He castles. Makes perfect sense. So do I keep my knight on its current square, or do I just play, like, um, knight takes d7 and then bishop d2? Hmm. I think I just like bishop d2. Let's be flexible. I feel like I'm going to have another crack at taking this guy. If he plays bishop e6, rook c1 is pretty good. Hitting the queen and also opening up knight c6 as an option. We have eight and a half minutes left. I'm not going to panic on time, but do want to watch that. I feel like the King's Indian attack is a, a decent weapon against the French, actually. Maybe less so against the Carol Khan. But uh, since Black's already committed to e6 on move one, I, I kind of like the type of positions you get out of the King's Indian attack. Like in the Carol Khan, there's a setup where Black can go c6, d5, e5, and put the bishop on d6 if you choose a King's Indian attack setup. That one appeals to me less. So that's why I've, I've generally played it against the French, but not the Caro. I think rook c1 is good here. We'll just gain a tempo on his queen. I might take on d7 next move. And maybe a bishop h3 type move would be good to hit a knight that could potentially be there and also kind of eye the c8 square. That's something to keep in mind. Yep, queen b6. If I play queen b3, he can just play bishop e6. So I think this is a good time to take this, this piece. And then bishop h3 is a nice move. Or do I want to take first on c c8 and then play bishop h3? Nah, let's not get fancy. Maybe b4 first, though. Speaking of getting fancy, because b4 first keeps his knight out of c5. There's something appealing about that. Yeah, let's play to restrict that knight. It's defended by our bishop on d2. We do weaken the c3 square a tiny bit. I maybe should have checked if rook c3 is any good. I don't think it is. Bishop takes, pawn takes. Move my king, he takes b4. Mm, he might have a little compensation. But it shouldn't be anything. I just like the look of this move because it controls c5. It's a nice aspect of it. What if he plays queen e6, trying to hit the pawn? Queen a6 seems artificial to me. I think queen b3 is a nice place to settle our queen. I wonder if he's making way for the knight to come in. Hmm. Queen b3, knight b6, trying to come into a4. Seems like a weird plan, but might be decent. Queen b3, knight b6, bishop h3, rook takes c1, rook takes c1, knight a4, rook c7. I would assume that's pretty promising. Hitting the bishop. 
Yeah, let's just do this. I'm still keeping that bishop move in reserve. We're defending the pawn, and also eyeing the f7 pawn. He does play knight b6. Okay, so let's go ahead with the plan. We'll pre-move this capture. I mean, the knight coming into a4 is like not that dangerous if my rook is already out on the c-file. If it's still stuck on c1, then yeah, knight coming to c3 could be a problem. Assuming I can't just like win a pawn or something. But with the rook coming to c7, if he trades, I think this is looking pretty good. He could play queen b7 here if he wants to stop rook c7. Maybe that's a decent way of playing. I could play e5, readjust my plan, and then bishop g2, like back, if I don't think that it's doing anything on this diagonal anymore. He plays queen a4. Well, I think I, I probably will just leave my queen where it is. Because if he takes me voluntarily, I take with my a pawn. Yeah, I've got really horrible pawns, but it controls exactly where the knight wants to go. And there's not really a good way he can play to attack those pawns either. So this looks good. B4 is covered, so there's no danger there. Let's go ahead and play this move. Pre-move this capture, just in case he wants to trade. But his knight will be hobbled. It'll be a hobbled horse if he takes on b3. I don't know what his plan is anyways uh, if he is not taking on b3 because there's nowhere for his queen to go. He'd have to back the queen up to a6 and then start over, but he just doesn't have time to do that, I don't think. Hmm. So bishop there. Now, I could take on a4 and then play rook takes a7. I could also move this rook, like rook c6 or something. But I think taking here and then taking a7 looks pretty good. So I take, he takes with the knight. I take a7, knight c3. We can just play a3, guarding that b4 pawn. Yeah, why not? Let's do it. We're going to be up two pawns then. And his rook is unable to join the battle. This bishop is a star piece controlling that crucial c8 square. Otherwise, like if our bishop were on g2 or something, rook c8 would be like an autopilot move, automatic move, not an autopilot move. <laughs> um, well, it might be an autopilot move too, but it would just be a good move for him to threaten to penetrate to c2. This is the only truly open file in the position, and I'm not letting him have it by keeping my bishop on h3. That's why bishops like do well on the side of the board compared to knights. You know, bishops are long-range pieces. They don't have to be centralized in order to do good work. This move I did not see going after the pawn, but I'm not worried. Maybe rook d7 is a cool way to play. Attacking this bishop, and I'm also hitting the d4 pawn. It could go rook d7, bishop b8. I can't take on d4 because he has bishop a7. I can always play bishop f1, but then he gets rook c8 in, is the thing. Hmm. Hmm. Let's think about this for just a moment. Knight b2 is a good move. It's probably his only chance in the position. e5. e5, he'll play bishop b8, so that's no good. I mean, I could just give him the d-pawn if I really wanted to. Just go after, like, say, his b-pawn. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to play rook d7. And after bishop b8, I'm just going to play king f1. That way, if knight takes d3, I can just play rook takes d4. And we basically traded a pair of pawns. And I maintain that two-pawn advantage. And I didn't have to divert my bishop. I think is a nice point about that. He'll probably play knight b2 after that and try to get into c4 again. But I can go rook b5 and start attacking that b-pawn. It's very helpful to be able to play king f1 soon. 
he's thinking here, but he doesn't really have any moves. I mean, he has to play bishop b8. The knight, or the bishop has no other squares that are safe. Hmm, he just resigned. Just tell him gg. I mean, I wonder if he saw that bishop b8, rook takes d4, there is this move. But um, I was planning just uh, king f1 instead. Take, and as I was saying to you guys, take here. And we're up two pawns. I mean, this knight is very nearly trapped, too. You can always escape through this square, which is kind of annoying, but it should just be a matter of time. Like, let's say rook here, attacking this pawn. Um, let's say knight c4. I think I could even just bring my king up. I'm not worried about an opposite color bishop ending because of the two pawn advantage plus this pawn falling. So this this should just be completely winning. Yeah, there's not a whole lot left to be said. So let's go through this game. Um, the setup that he chose is normal up to a point. So right here, usually black plays bishop e7 against this king's Indian attack. So there's a line that goes bishop e7, castle, castle, um, e5, knight d7, rook e1, queen c7, queen e2, and then b5. And then after, um, I believe it goes knight f1, a5, h4. Like both sides start pushing. The white standard attacking schemes will be like knight uh, 1 to h2, pawn to h5, knight up to g4. This bishop usually comes to f4. White can look to play h6 or sometimes even knight f6 as a sacrifice. Whereas black will be trying to push these pawns and create contact with white's queenside pawns as quickly as possible. The nice thing about the king's Indian attack, and also why a lot of people play the king's Indian defense, is that it's kind of comforting in a way when you know that your plan is to attack the enemy king, like in that position I just showed. Whereas your opponent's plan is to attack like an area of the board, like the queen side. You saw black was pushing the pawns on the queen side. Um... Because the stakes are always going to be higher against the king, right? So aficionados and proponents of uh, the king's Indian attack and the king's Indian will argue that, I mean, even if there's something like slightly unsound about it, the stakes are always higher for their opponent. Like if you get at the king, it's all over. If you get at the queen side, well, that's nice, but you've only, you haven't won the game yet. You've conquered a side of the board, but you haven't won the game. So... Um, I do think bishop e7 is a good setup. There's some other good setups for black too. I mean, there's, there's a wide range of things black can do against the king's Indian attack. I mean, it's not, as you can see, it's not the most ambitious looking setup at the outset. I mean, black can even play c5 if they're comfortable um, adopting a more Sicilian type position, like a closed Sicilian. I mean, one setup that um, I think is kind of nice, well, let me just play the standard moves for white, is just this setup with... Um, the bishop coming to g7 and the knight coming to e7, and black retaining options of playing d6 or d5, and doing the same thing like pushing over here. But the Fianchetto dark square bishop gives black some measure of uh, safety around their king compared to the lines where the bishop's on e7. There's other lines too where like d5 here, black can do like an early capture on e4, like here, here. Um, I always forget how exactly how some of these lines go, but like say, say b6 for instance, Maybe knight c6 first. And then let's say g3. Um, b6, bishop g2, take, take. There's lines where like black will trade on e4 at strategic time and then play bishop a6 to stop white from castling. So if you're black, you just want to have like one or two go-to setups against this. Um, if you do and you've studied it a little bit, it's not going to give you any sleepless nights. But it is a nice weapon for white too because a lot of players do neglect the study of this variation and uh, some of the attacking schemes are, are kind of nice to know. Um, I wouldn't recommend playing this all the time, like I said, because I think playing system openings is not a good way to improve. But uh, as an occasional weapon, it's kind of nice. Look up Bobby's Bobby Fisher's games from the white side of the King's Indian attack if you're interested. He's won some nice games in this. Particular in particular, this game he played against um, this guy Miag Masarin. It was very instructive um, where Fisher crashed through and actually sacrifices queen and won in an instructive game. So I don't like my opponent's queen c7 and bishop d7 moves. I think those are a little bit too committal. If I were black, I'd rather complete my development, castle king side quicker. I mean, I couldn't find like an outright way to punish that because an outright way to punish it might not exist, but you could see he was kind of playing catch up on his development. 
Here I had a little bit of a think. I was deciding between moves like knight c4, um, a4 to secure the knight on c4, e5. Don't know if there's any one right approach here. The engine likes e5, knight d5, knight e4. This pawn cannot be captured yet because probably bad stuff like knight takes c5, discovered attack on the queen is going to happen. But I played c3. He went bishop e7. Maybe e5 would have been a better option. And then take here. Could have been safer than the game. But bishop e7, I took on d4. I don't like that move by him, knight takes. Because actually after this, it's very nice that my f-pawn is freed up. As you saw in the game, I was able to quickly scoot that up the board. So if I were black, I would have played just c takes d4. Computer also agrees. It's annoying for him that he has to keep his knight tied down, but that's better than allowing me to like trade and open up the position further. So he takes here. I took. Now the engine really likes a plan e5, knight moves, and then queen g4. I didn't think about that at all. I'm trying to use the queen aggressively against his king. That's a nice plan. And if castles knight b3, I guess this d4 pawn is impossible to defend for him. Also, there's bishop h6 with my queen on g4. Yeah, I didn't look at that plan one bit. <laughs> I just saw that my knight was coming to c4, and I liked the prospect of the bishop coming out here too. So the engine claims that black needs to bite the bullet and castle and allow bishop f4 and then just make like a queen move. But it looks really nice for me. I feel, I feel like my position's simple to play. Yeah, I like my space and my bishops. The prospect of e5 maybe discovered attacks. Looks very nice. So he played e5, I get to play f4. Yeah, b5 is almost a losing move, I'd say. But um, if he had played knight g4, I think I was going to take on e5 against that move. And if he goes here, bishop f4 should be good pinning. Um, if, let's say, bishop d6, I think, yeah, I can do this and then queen h5. It's a nice option. Hitting the bishop again, also stopping f6 to support the bishop. And then when the bishop moves, like say bishop f6, e5 is going to crash through. We're threatening the bishop. If bishop e7, I assume like e6 is a, a good move. Knight d6 check. check probably just wins on the spot. Oh yeah, forking the king in the pawn. If the bishop takes, check. we just win everything. Discover check, win the queen. See how fast white's pieces can get coordinated just because black hasn't castled yet. Um, he really needs like a pawn on f6. He needs like his bishop on e6, the knight on d7, and a pawn on f6 to expect to like hold on to this pawn structure. Now it's kind of crumbling. And yeah, b5 was a big blunder, but as you can see, it's not a it's not a rosy position for him anyways. Taking would just be pretty awful, I think, after bishop takes f4. He's got to move his queen again. Again, e5 is a possibility. So b5, I was wondering about this line. I thought about that. The main point being this and then take here. And I think I win material because we're going to play e5 next move, regardless of which way he takes. Hitting the rook, also enabling threats down the e-file. But um, I rejected it because I thought he might be able to play knight here. And then apparently knight e6 is good. I think I looked at that, didn't I? I thought I looked at that move. Hmm. There's something about this I didn't quite like or like wasn't sure about, and that's why I didn't play it. I saw this position in my head, and the engine says it's like winning for white, but I don't know. At the time, it looked a little bit unclear, like this pawn might be lost, and if that pawn's lost, my knight doesn't have a defender, but I guess the pressure on f7 is pretty significant too. Knight takes e5, knight takes f7, sacrifice the knight, take e5, line opening move. Yikes. <laughs> Bishop c6, queen b3, hit that pin knight. Bishop f6, take, take on f6, I assume. Yeah, white's attack rages on. Take, bishop f4, looks very good. Rook to c1 coming. So, there's a couple ways to skin the cat here. Um, I just took on e5 with the knight, the safer move. Then just focused on standard development. Rook to c1. I do like the role of my light square bishop. I feel this is nice. Ah, again, this queen g4 move. I wasn't looking at queen g4 like ever in this game. I just 
I don't know, maybe took it for granted that it would end up on the queen side somewhere. Computer likes this move. Yeah, that is a good move because if knight f6, I can take on c8 and I get two rooks for Check. the queen. And even though I've said in the past that when you're winning or close to winning, you want to minimize material imbalances, here I'm like winning even more material. If bishop f8, I have bishop b4 and bye bye bishop, I think. Knight d7, bishop h3, and the whole house of cards is going to collapse. I'll take d7 and win his bishop. So you do want to minimize imbalances when you're winning, but um, that doesn't mean you have to like totally neuter your play. You know, you can continue playing as normal. You just if it comes down to like a, a smooth way to win the position versus a more volatile one, and they're equal in your eyes, I mean, you should always trend towards the smoother one when you're winning. Maybe b4 wasn't such a good move. I don't know. I just like the look of it to keep his knight out of c5. There is rook c3 as a possibility. I didn't see that until after I played b4, but it's an exchange sack. It's so like take Check. and take, but that's exactly the thing that might shake up the position and um, enable him to like fight back a little bit. King h1, bishop takes b4, and he does have a 3 to 1 majority on the queen side. I should still be winning, but hey, it might have been worth a shot. I don't think he was looking at that move, though. He played queen a6, I went queen b3, now this is a nice place for my queen. Knight here, bishop h3, this bishop sniping from the h3 square, forcing him to make a decision about the rook. Yeah, and I thought he was going to play knight into a4, I was ready to go rook c7. And I noticed a nifty idea, if he... Oh, it doesn't work though. Okay, if he goes here, I thought I might be able to do this and then play bishop e6. But I see now he has queen b7 to defend the rook. So I guess I'm not winning in this line. But I'm sure knight a4, rook c7 would still be good for me. I mean, even, yeah, like a move like rook d7. He's tied down to f7. I'm not that concerned about the knight coming into c3. It's very good. e5, e6 is a clear plan for me. But he instead played the queen into a4. I penetrated. And like I said, even though superficially white gets double isolated pawns, like how is this knight going to get in? And meanwhile, we're hitting the, the uh, bishop on e7 and also the pawn on a7. So he played bishop d6. We just traded, took on a7. Knight b2. Didn't see that move, but yeah, it shouldn't really matter. I guess there's a couple ways to try to win this. e5, bishop b8, rook b7. Knight takes, bishop f1, let's say knight back here, bishop takes b5, yeah, white's just dominating. This knight is almost trapped again, the d-pawn's not going anywhere, there's just no semblance of coordination in this position. So it's just a cleanup job, the two bishops and the extra material is more than sufficient. So, okay, I'm glad I was able to play a king's Indian attack in this one. Um, yeah, and I think my opponent's setup was just a little suspect, probably they should have stuck to a more traditional scheme with moving the dark square bishop and castling. So um, if the French confounds you, you might want to try this opening a time or two and see if you like it. Study Fisher's game. Check that Fisher versus Mieg Mosserin game I was telling you about. All right, hope you guys enjoyed this video. I'll be back tomorrow with another standard video. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.